to your cell phones. We've been having a lot of issue with that this weekend. I am Shango Lose, host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you like listening to smart interviews with the top minds in cannabis, I invite you to check out this show at shapingfire.com. We also have an extraordinary YouTube channel with over 150 speaker videos that have recorded at events just like this one, including our present speaker, Colin Bell, and our last speaker, Jeff Lowenfels. Um, there are postcards at the back near the door to help you remember the name, Shaping Fire. Colin Bell is the co-founder and chief growth officer at Grosentia Mammoth Microbes. He received his PhD in biological sciences, specializing in soil microbial uh, ecology and plant microbe interactions. Today, Colin will be presenting scientifically driven solutions to maximize plant yield and quality. Please welcome Colin Bell. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you for the introduction, Shango, and thanks for everyone being here. This is an awesome show and we love supporting it. I'm gonna kind of sit right here and this will be a casual conversation about, you know, we're talking about precision agriculture. We're talking about using microbes in precision agriculture and I talk about that a lot uh, as a PhD research scientist. And some of the problems I focused on uh, at the university, they actually, I still think about them quite a bit. And I don't address them a lot. And I think more and more as the cannabis industry merges into general agriculture, I'm starting to be able to merge some of my research interests uh, broadly, the agriculture research interests into this area of cannabis more and more. And so what I'm gonna do is kind of morph some of the research and challenges that I was addressing in agriculture into this talk and tie it all together about how actually how we engage as a cannabis community in the cannabis industry is going to address all the larger scale agriculture challenges, at least that's what I believe. So I'm the co-founder of a company. Started off at the university, PhD in microbiology. My academic speciality is focused on understanding plant microbe interactions. And I did a lot of things in my life and this is the area and the passion that captured me. So this is really, where I live, no matter what. You know, we have uh, developed a company, I left the university back in March 2015 with a technology that you'll learn a little bit about during this talk. And the idea was to bring nature to agriculture using natural solutions. Just wanted to see how it would work. You know, I didn't have a huge business background and now we have a company of over 60 people and we're selling this technology globally. So there's been a huge learning curve for me not only how to scale a company, but to engage in business. But honestly, I'm a biologist and a microbiologist, and so I surround myself with excellent people to help bridge the gap and to be mentors for me and to help me learn and grow. And although business in general in this really dynamic industry is stimulating and intellectually very stimulating, and I love to learn, I actually still find most of my mental space occupied with nature and biology, quite honestly. And the specific area that I focused on and that I was, my PhD was, was microbial ecology. You know, and so when I'm thinking about life, I'm talking to you and I'm engaging and we're doing a lot of interesting things, but when I'm by myself or working, I frame how I think about life and how life works back to the very basics of my academic training which is, how does nature work? How does life work? It's like my mental foundation. And by definition, I think it's interesting, and I kind of broke down this word for you. This is how I think, and this is how I think life operates. And if life means agriculture or any kind of biotic interactions, I think this fits. So microbial ecology, the study of interactions of microorganisms in other biotic environments in their physical space typically ecology at a microbial scale. Microbes, soil bacteria and fungi, you can think about that in aquatic systems also. The other part of this is what I think is interesting, eco-combining and logic. Strict principles, meaning. And I'm gonna present a talk today that I'm not sure where everyone in the audience or who I engage with is on board with but what I wanted to do, and I think it's interesting, is to present a case of why I think microbes are actually the foundation of all life on Earth. 
I'm going to present some specific cases of how we can think about that. And you know, I'll present it to you, and you can make the decision for yourself. Then I'm also going to present some things that I think about in general agriculture of real challenges at a global level. And we're going to tie these two together because I think biology is the solution for a lot of challenges that we face, both with human health and with agriculture. Peter said it really good in a talk yesterday. There's Western medicine, there's Eastern medicine, and in today's age, I think we're figuring out how to bridge that gap. And so let's bring biology back into this dialogue a little bit. And then we'll talk about some solutions that we think are effective, biological solutions to address today's issues in this industry. And then finishing it off, I'm gonna kind of wrap this all up by giving an argument for why the cannabis industry is not only important for human health, but for global agriculture. So soil microbes, quite simply. Why are they the foundation of all life on Earth? I'm going to present three really basic case studies that we can kind of think about. The first one, let's talk about humans. We can all relate to us. You think about probiotics. You know, what we've learned with the Human Microbiome Project is amazing over the last decade. We think that microbes control our health. We think they probably control a lot of our moods. Sorry about that. Appreciate it. We know that we are composed of more microbial cells than human cells. That alone presents a pretty interesting case for me to think there's something to microbes that represent a foundation of how I'm gonna succeed as a human. We have microbes growing on our skin, different microbes in our mouth, different microbes in our guts, and they all facilitate our physiology, our metabolism. They help us absorb nutrients. They protect us against pathogens. They stimulate our immune response. And microbes do the same thing for plants. This is, from a trophic perspective, what I learned in high school. And I learned that plants were the foundation of all life on Earth. Quite simply, because plants provide the food source for herbivores, and herbivores provide the food source for secondary and tertiary and primary predators. Makes sense. What biologists in high school, and even in my college classes and undergraduate, didn't talk about, was that all plants grow in soil, and no plant exists in nature without microbial interactions. And the soil is teeming with life. And so what I would argue here, pardon, I'll get used to this in a second, is that if plants are the foundation of all life on Earth, then you can't really sustain plant growth without soil microbial interactions, that would suggest that soil microbes represent the foundation and the representation and generation of the energy required to sustain all life. And the same thing's true for the soil food web below ground. As decaying plant organic matter drops to the soil, the first line of primary consumers are soil microbes, bacteria and fungi. They not only create available nutrients to allow plants to grow above ground, which support all other trophic levels, but they create, in many cases, a food source supporting secondary and higher consumers. And it makes a lot of sense to think that soil microbes should be used in agriculture systems. Again, there's no plant in nature 
that exists without soil microbes, and they're very abundant. This is an example of just a handful of soil. I've collected soil for two decades now in desert systems and agriculture systems and forested systems, and you can find easily over 10,000 bacterial species alone in, anyone, alone in any one handful of soil. And the abundance of bacteria alone around the surface of the earth is around five nanillion. Nanillion? Nanillion. Do we know what a nanillion yeah. is? Yeah. 30 zeros? It's a big number. That's an enormous amount of energy supporting life on earth. And bacteria in particular have been supporting life, all of the life, since the very beginning of time. In geologic time, Scientists think that bacteria evolved about three billion years ago. Gotcha. Do they know the chemistry that created the bacteria or where the bacteria came from? Can we talk about that in another seminar? <laughs> That's actually a big topic. Cool. Yeah. There's hypothesis. Yeah. It's very interesting hypothesis, actually. So I'm not going to support this data. I think this is very commonly thought of as, uh, as the lifetime of the tree of life, so to speak. Fungi evolved about 900 million years ago. And if you think about the delta of time, that's enormous. And plants evolved about 700 million years ago into a microbial world where roots extended into soils teeming with microbial life. And bacteria and fungi engaged with plant roots and vice versa to support plant success by stimulating plant physiology and metabolism, by cycling nutrients in the soil, making nutrients bioavailable so plants can take up and nourish themselves. And what we know about plants is, as a microbiologist, and don't take offense to this, we used to kind of poke fun at the plant physiologists and we used to call plants charismatic carbon pumps. <laughs> Because we thought we were more special than the plant people. Plants do a great job of pumping carbon from the atmosphere to create the biomass. And they need everything else from the soil and the microbes facilitate that. All of the macro and micronutrients and trace metals. Microbes protect plants against pathogens growing along the surface area of their roots, competing against pathogens. And they stimulate plant immune responses to chemical signaling. And this is an animation that I developed. It's not great, but it's something I wanted to give a visual of how you can think microbes interacting in the soil horizon, engaging with plant roots to cycle nutrients. Because honestly, we think more than anything about else about using beneficial microbes in cultivation to maximize nutrient use efficiency. And we'll talk a little more about this. But this is an example of a oversized bacterial cell. It's a bacillus, and these are flagella, and many bacterial species have flagella, and they're like little tails, and they allow them to be mobile in the soil solution, and they swim. And they can engage with plant roots, and they can go down several meters following plant roots, and they love this environment. And they engage, and what happens? They don't have hands, they don't have mouths, they can swim around, but nutrients are bound in this environment and it takes activity to release nutrients from this environment. Roots will actually feed carbon to these microbes to stimulate activity. But these microbes need to make tools also to actually facilitate nutrient cycling. And they do that through one mode of action by creating, we can call them picks and shovels, but they're really enzymes or exoenzymes. And exoenzymes are not living, or enzymes are not living things. You can think of them literally as a pick or a shovel. They're multi-protein functional structures that usually have a specific function to target specific nutrients so the bacterial cell can nurture itself. <laughs> and it can do this in the form 
a phosphate or ammonium. And there's other modes of action, but the same thing is true. It creates tools and exudes them in the environment to release minerals. And plants love engaging with diverse microbial communities because microbes are active, they're facilitating fertility by releasing nutrients into the soil and plants will grow in there and they've evolved to grow in there into diverse microbial environments and success, especially early on evolutionarily, was associated with capturing nutrients in the soil and that was associated with microbes in the soil. And as I said earlier, there's root exudate where we, we already call plants charismatic carbon pumps and they do that for a reason, they put in biomass, but they also suck up carbon to feed soil microbes. And they can exude over half of the photosynthate or carbon from the atmosphere that they take up through their roots into the soil to feed soil microbial communities, to stimulate activity, to stimulate en enzyme production, among other things, to create, to create hot spots of fertility. And of course, plants also do a good job of sucking below ground. And they take up water, and they take up nutrients in that soil solution, and that's why microbes are so critical in any soil environment for plant success. And this works in all environments. And we know it does. This is an example of many combined studies, and this is kind of pre-green revolution, where before conventional fertilizer, fertigation, genetics, you see a huge delta with conventional fertilizer input. Fertilizer works, it's very important. Plants have to be nourished. But there's challenges with nutrient use efficiency and how fertilizer interacts with soils and substrates in particular. And biology can actually stimulate the uptake of nutrients and maximize the nutrient availability to increase crop yield among many crops. And there's challenges. Nutrient use efficiency is a huge global challenge. I've been talking about this for about a decade and it continues <coughs> to increase as far as the environmental conditions that agriculture systems impose in agroecosystems. This is an example of phosphorus. I talk about phosphorus a lot because I focus on it. Nitrogen's a huge challenge also, where farmers will actually add as much nutrients as they possibly can to deliver to the plants. And we know these nutrients, phosphorus in particular, build up for decades. And this is kind of how it works. As farmers add phosphorus fertilizer to soil, they want it to remain in a lay bottle pool so plants can take it up. But what happens is almost immediately, phosphorus in particular, this is a little easier to talk about phosphorus, but this is conceptually happening, or it's getting leached from a system with a lot of different ions, immediately sorbs in stronger, strongly sorbed pools and in different environments. Phosphorus binds with calcium in alkaline systems. Phosphorus binds with iron and aluminum in acidic systems. And it can remain in soils for decades. And the challenge with this is every season, farmers have to add about 70% more phosphorus than their plants are gonna take up. And it continues to go to these strongly sorbed pools. And it builds up decade or year after year, up to a decade plus, until all the exchange sites are saturated in your soil. And then what happens? this happens. Agriculture runoff, and that's a direct result of over fertilization. This is in lakes in the Northeast, in Florida, 
you can go on Google right now and look at a picture of the runoff from the Mississippi River that's surrounded by agriculture systems from north to south. And they call that area in the Gulf of Mexico the dead zone because it's a dead zone because of eutrophism, because of too much fertilizer. It's a problem. And we know clearly that microbes have the potential to unlock nutrients from the strongly sorbed pool back to the laid off pool. So plants can actually engage with available nutrients to maximize yield, quality, development. And this is a couple of examples of hundreds of papers. This is just science. We know this is true. Do you want to save questions for the end? Or? Yeah, do you mind? No, that's cool. Okay. Check and although we know this, and this is a really interesting challenge for academic and scientists and application in agriculture, there's a huge chasm or a gap that's hard to bridge. Because although we know biology works, and although we know that agriculture pollution continues to be a challenge, pardon, we see, and, and although, and this is what's interesting, we now have long-term agriculture data sets that show that agriculture practices significantly decline microbial biodiversity. So this is painting a picture of practices. We know a solution. We know the practices are detrimental to how soil can sustain its own life and support crops. So it's an interesting challenge. I'm not preaching here. I think it's a very intellectually stimulating challenge. It's occurring. And I like to be part of the solution, but painting this picture is the first piece of it. And there's another piece to it. I'll talk you through this, but what all of these charts show is on a global scale, fertilizer increase, increased fertilizer applications have never been higher, ever. In Western Europe, they're really focused on declining fertilizer. And this is a chart of nitrogen. I believe this is phosphorus and yeah, and this is potassium. Everywhere except for in Western Europe, we're seeing huge increases, ages of big culprit. Culprit meaning the highest levels. South Asia, Latin America, North America is not. A little more focused on uh, reductions, Africa depending on the nutrient, it's happening everywhere. So now we're in this situation where we're significantly <coughs> increasing fertilizer usage. We know that biology is harmed, soil biology, by fertilizer usage, and we're getting challenged environmentally. And so you'll hear people, lots of people say, we're training our soils to be addicted to fertilizers because they can't sustain life without it. So this hurt a lot. And an encouraging note, and I haven't validated this yet, I was looking and I didn't read enough to get to the meat of it. I was talking to one of our, our partners who is an, who's an Australian, but he's uh, working in Singapore. And for a while now, because China, and I'll just talk about China because I know uh, this is fresh on my mind, is horribly challenged with environmental uh, pollution through the coal burning. There's a lot of heavy metals in the soil. I've had partners from Driscoll, various partners, meaning uh, research partners, go and try to find arable land in China so they can grow berries. Because quite frankly, Asians love berries and you can sell them for gangster prices. And so they wanted to sell, grow berries any way they could. And they couldn't find one acre that they would support their berries on because of the pollution. And there's been a mandate for a while of biological additions to agriculture systems to bridge that gap. 
and so I'll say this because I was told this, but I don't know for sure where it is in the, in the in the policy. What I'm hearing is they're trying to cause a mandate, and I heard they passed it. So with a grain of salt, that they're trying to eliminate fertilizer in China. That's a big statement. That's a big statement, and because they have to. So this is where academically. I stepped in, I've been thinking about these challenges for years, and we stepped in, you know, late 2013, conceptually putting all this picture together, because this has been going on for a long time, and understanding where maybe as a scientist and a scientific team that's supposed to be world leaders in soil biology and all this stuff, we can make a difference. We've published a lot of papers. We've gotten a lot of grant money. We were very successful academics, and we told everybody that we were gonna change the world with our science. And we realized at some point in late 2013 that we weren't doing any of that. We were publishing papers and getting grant money and you know, showing our peers in academia how great our papers were or whatever. Never engaged with farmers, never even knew how to engage with farmers, and never didn't know how to make technologies that we could get in the hands of farmers to bring them value. And literally, we'd write that in our impact statements. And so this is us, you know, working with microbes in the lab, talking a big game. But we decided to make a difference. And so we ended up thinking about how we should make a difference. And we did something that was really interesting, and this was late 2013 and into 2014. We started getting out of the lab and going into the field and talking to farmers to understand what we didn't know. And that's what I do now, and it's called discovery. We had some hypothesis, maybe we can make a difference, and maybe if we made something, farmers would like it. Let's go talk to some farmers and see what they think. And we talked to hundreds of them, and we realized that there was a need, and we could start developing something that might bridge the gap, to bring value to farmers. You know, I didn't get a PhD, quite frankly, to get rich, I had to do stuff that was cool, that engaged me, that interested me, that fulfilled me. So this is what we came up with. And I'll show you how we work through. We have a technology, you can see it out of our booth, but it's about developing microbial solutions with precision and confidence to target problems in agroecosystems and bring value to farmers. And so we came up, we got about a million dollar grant pretty quickly to flip our lab from a basic science lab to an applied science lab, start working on applied solutions for agriculture. That was a huge change and frame shift from how we were thinking about academia up to that point. And I had a hard time actually conceiving how, as a microbial ecologist, I could ever be an applied scientist. And then it just changed in like a month. I was like, oh, I guess we can. So we started doing that. We collected soils from all over the world we wanted to identify highly functional microbes that could target phosphor cycling. And the idea, and this was a phosphorus problem that we wanted to work on, that's kind of why I've highlighted the phosphorus challenge in the preface to this slide, was we know phosphorus builds up in soils for decades, and we thought if we could develop life that would mine the phosphorus that's built up in soils for decades, we could talk farmers into reducing phosphorus fertilizer inputs and use life to mine the existing phosphorus. And again, it's about a balance. I'm not asking anyone to change anything. I'm asking people to think about balance. We grew the microbes up from hundreds of different ecosystems. We screened them for their ability to cycle phosphorus. And we have developing this technology. Patented it. Again, left the university in March 2015 to start this company. And this is the technology. It's Mammoth P. And this is a liquid organic microbial living additive that enhances plant phosphorus uptake. And again, this is another thing that's interesting and engaging. You know, we're data driven. We brought science to everything we do. And we have a team of 63 people now. A third of them are very, very expensive scientists. And all we do is validate what we do. And we publish our work. And we test it in our greenhouses. And I'll say right now, and this might be a little controversial, what we realize when we engage with farmers, hundreds and hundreds of farmers, when I talk about the discovery that we did, 
was that we learned that as a young technology in a young company, and it was a free company at that time, agriculture is where interesting young technologies often go to die. We were told, sure, we'll partner with you, we'll take your technology, we'll validate it rigorously, and in 10 to 20 years, we'll get back to you. Yeah. And I was thinking, maybe, yeah, if it works, every year back to back, you might be onto something. And what, what, what I was thinking is, I didn't know what I didn't know, but what I did know is, how am I supposed to support a young startup for 10 or 20 years without any revenue? How am I supposed to learn anything if I hand over the keys to the kingdom? And what I wanted to do more than anything else was control the fate of the technology. It wasn't because I have control issues. I tell my girlfriend that every single day. <laughs> That's because I wanted to learn. And I didn't think handing anything to anyone without any visibility would have given me the idea to learn how to grow. And I have to engage with people to learn. That's who I am. And. We have, uh, we're pretty sophisticated in the way we think about agriculture challenges, and I think we're pretty sophisticated as a team in the way we think about developing technologies for them, and we're rigorous in how we test them. I don't care how sophisticated or non-sophisticated technology is, it better work. It better work repeatedly, it better work in a lot of environments, and I'll bring that data to the market all day long, or it's not coming under our brand. You know, we do test our technology rigorously internally, we also test it with the scientific peer review community. I'll publish our work and make sure that we get acceptance and the data that we're producing is publishable. And this is one of the papers that we have had published on the technology on cannabis sativa. And we test it in, in the market. We have a team of people in the field and all they do is engage. Risk-free, does this work for you? Does this bring you value? Because honestly, my job was to educate and support and bring value. And that's how we started this company. It's about bringing solutions to agriculture. And the cannabis industry adopted us and it created a foundation to allow us to launch a new technology that brings in value and has application uh, on a global scale. We've been featured and the technology's been featured in a lot of media outlets and we, you know, we have a ton of a ton of testimonials, and this is some of the cool stuff where, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but this was a genetics company that was using mammoth, and what they saw was significant increases in, you know, seed health. I think that's cool. Now, if I actually collected this data a long time ago, I didn't know what to do with it. And then someone else was bringing it to me, I was like, oh, I knew that. And, you know, they said, well, why didn't you tell me that before you school? <laughs> Cloning, you know. This is an example of uh, an Oregon clone facility. And we're like, we'll tell you what, skip a strip with non-application. Wow, that's a great picture. Pretty cool picture, right? And you know, I didn't even know about this picture until earlier this year, and Josie said, hey, I got a cool picture. And I saw this, I was like, are you kidding me? This picture tells a thousand words. Please share that with me. So, you know, we, we're a young team. We have a lot of room to grow. You know, this is something that someone just shared with me. I always change these pictures out. Someone just shared with us, you know, two days ago. We see it. Increased quality. I think it's very, very important. There's so much application for microbes. This isn't about me and isn't about Mammoth B. It's about microbes in general. You want to have the data back, and you can ask Jeff, and I think one of the strongest messages that Jeff shares is make manufacturers validate technology for you and it's your responsibility to validate yourself. And so we're trying to do our part to bring the rigor to this industry. So on that note, this is how we engage. This is something we're learning and we're growing, but at the end of the day, this is nothing that anyone in any other industry wouldn't do in agriculture. Let's go out, let's talk to a farmer. Let's learn about their practices. Let's develop relationships. Let's see if there's a need. Let's make sure you know how to conduct, and Peter will talk some about this uh, after my talk, experimental designs, so you can see real differences. And if you can add something to your facility that's making you a lot of money, and it can make you more money by increasing yield or quality or decreasing time, whatever those things are, you wanna do it right so you can really see the difference. This isn't about selling product, it's about bringing a ton of value. 
So this next data I'm going to show you is where we engage in a large facility. And this is an exam, a pretty extreme example because it's a pretty big drum. It's just this process. We engaged them. They could do a controlled side by side. They were making a lot of money. Of course, they didn't think they could do anything better, but they're traveling, so maybe they did. Put in a biological, which you weren't using, don't change anything else. Help us help you. Let's collect this data. You bring the data to us. We'll put it in our ROI calculator that we'll provide for you. Real world market prices. Does one additive move the needle for you? In quality, in yield, and ultimately, for the big wig, the C-suite, in today's day and age, large facilities, it's about, you know, moving the revenue needle. So on one strain, this facility was grown that they'd grown for years, they didn't think they could do any better, adding in one biological, they got a 13% increase in yield, they got a delta, just to qualify this, from 18 to 22% increase in THC, and they got a delta from 2 to 8% increase in terpene profiles, relatively. And so we could quantify some value to them, extrapolating out across the year, across their facility. And this was fun for me, because I'm like, oh cool, microbes are bringing you value, and so I kind of leave it at that. And people are looking at the bottom line. And it turns out that at real world market prices in Washington, this facility by adding in a microbe could add an extra $6.4 million to the bottom line annually. And, and quite honestly, I put that there because I always put that number there. It was really like them giving me a dollar and me giving a hundred dollar bill back. It was about a hundred one ROI because our product doesn't cost that much to generate that kind of revenue. And there's a lot of examples and a lot of technologies that if you can evaluate the rigor and you can get behind the data, you might really bring value to your cultivation facility or your indoor facility or your home grow. Lots of value. We are up to 100, over 100 Canada's Cup Awards uh, with mammoth heroes now. We, we came out with a new technology. I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this for a second. You know, it's really weird as a young startup uh, who was a microbiologist and now we're trying to figure out how to bridge more value and where we see different industry verticals that are important. And so, you know, the two pain points I really saw was nutrient use efficiency, and I took that from academia, and applying that to cannabis, but the biocontrol or pest prevention is a huge pain point. And so we're starting to bridge the gap, and we came up with a pretty interesting technology. Uh, there, I just wanted to say, um, understanding how to tell that story is, is uh, important. And it's an exciting time to be in the cannabis industry. It's gonna grow. You know, I've been focused internationally. It's over a $400 billion opportunity on a global scale. It's over a $100 billion opportunity in North America. And, and that's all good. But honestly, where, where I am, it's not about an opportunity, although I'm forced to look at some of that stuff and maybe it's a little painful and I have people that help me look at that. It's about bridging the gap between nature and agriculture because of all the stuff I talked about before. You know, and this industry, allows me to understand and learn how to develop technologies that are scalable for agriculture and hemp is a, is a big deal for us. A lot of hemp growers are using technology because I felt like if we can understand how to scale as a young company into hemp, it's the gateway crop to bring value to other, to other farmers, but that's not our focus. Our focus is 100% cannabis. But someone might get value out of that and this is helping us understand what we don't know about that. Ultimately, you know, I think the future of agriculture is understanding the nature in agriculture. And we have a long way to go, and there's a lot of barriers to get there. But with the movements of China, that I've come to understand, and the movements of the biostimulant industry, the microbial biostimulant industry, which is actually the quickest growing agriculture segment across all crops, it's headed the right direction. And I'm here to support it. I appreciate your time. We've got time to probably about two questions. Do you still have that question? You
Thanks for the talk. I'm all good. All right. Thanks for the speech, Colin. Um, we get grow questions a bit on IPM plant problems, and I always take it all the way back to, okay, do you have a healthy soil or are you using microbes? Because I say plant health is your first resistance to plant problems. Do you guys do, or have you seen any studies that, to tie in, you know, healthy microbes, this grower's inoculated, you know, and it, everything's going well versus a row that has in our with pest prevention. I mean, obviously, like I said, it's healthy plants do resist stuff. We have microbes or plants are going to be healthier, but it doesn't seem to be brought up much in IPM discussion is like sprays, drenches. Uh, so throwing that category in there, is there any research on that? You know, I think it's, I think it's well understood and it's really hard to correlate that data to a, to a causal, a healthy microbiome is really going to stop uh, spider mites or something like that. I think that there's a, a balance between there, but I'm not going to say anecdotally. I asked that question on on a, on a lower scale and thinking about just the plant's immune response. And I looked at overall microbial counts on flower uh, in a greenhouse facility and in an outdoor facility uh, in a very controlled side by side with microbes and without microbes. And I was just interested to see the data, you know. And, my R&D team gets pissed because I have a hundred questions. I'll ask them to do stuff, and it turns out it takes a long time to do it. answer Colin's questions sometimes, you know. But we did that study, and what we found out was really uh, it was pretty encouraging. But it was more about hypothesis generating um, data set. Was in both cases, the plants that received microbes in the rhizosphere in the feed had less CFUs in the final flower count. And I would, I would ask that question because the growers in Las Vegas in particular are getting bombarded with CFU counts and it's very a hard. Mold or? Yeah, there's mold counts or bacterial counts in general. What happens in, in Vegas is such a dusty uh, state in general that the greenhouses that were getting built out, they couldn't keep the dust out. And bacteria carry on dust. I mean, we're breathing in bacteria right now, quite frankly, like especially outside. That's one of the carriers, wind, dust, et cetera. And just getting planted on the sticky flowers uh, improves the CFU counts and it can that can fail flower. It's not it's not at the species or the genius level right now. It's just at the gross count level. And so I asked the question. And we got answers. Do we think so? Yeah. Do I think that there's a balance of you know bugs are pretty resistant also. So probably a lot more research and opportunity to to get real resolution of that particular question. Yeah. Right on. Thanks. We are at time. Thank you very much, Colin Bell. Hi. Cannabis. Oh, what did I do? Cannabis. Check them out. Thanks. Peace, everyone. Go follow him Peace. on Instagram and go check that out. <laughs> do you want me to introduce you? You want us to be, want to be on here? Or you want to stay out? So, huh? Well, okay, how, just speak. Okay, so this this guy came up and told me, I have a story to tell you guys. 
I'm sitting here in a class and I went to introduce myself and he comes up and I introduces myself and he knows my name. And he tells me he's from New Zealand and has been following me, you guys, and has been watching the regenerative conference classes and all of that stuff. So, thank you. It's been awesome, thank you, Tara. <laughs> yeah, thank you. and I love his accent. Okay, here, he has to wave. See? Yeah, there's one of my listeners. So, if you guys see me in an event, come say hi. Because I appreciate this. This is it's really cool. And that's why I do these things to come meet these people. And hang out. Awesome. Thanks, Tara. Dabs later. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta come have rosin dabs. So, uh, Tao, I will get that answer for you. I'm gonna go ahead and shut the video down, but I'll get that answered for you. And uh, I will put it in after chat. How's that? Yes, really good, really good. Yeah, Colin's awesome. And maybe we'll do an interview with Colin on my channel. And I want to know more about the um, the pesticide thing. Because, or not the pesticide, it's not a pesticide. The prevention because of the mites. So, yeah. Okay, bye guys. Love you.